I'd like to divide this talk into three, the effects, the spin, and our options as orthopaedic surgeons. Looking at the facts, uh, Freeman in uh, 2000 published a large meta-analysis looking at 52 studies of some 11,000 patients uh, where the post-operative DVT status was assessed using venography. And he found a DVT rate varied between some 40% to 75% and a fatal pulmonary embolism rate of about 0.2% to 3.4%. That was then. Now, with uh, prophylaxis, uh, Freeman uh, found that um, uh, the DVT rate could be altered, and with mo uh, low molecular weight heparin, it was about 17%. Standard heparin, low dose, low dose about uh, 30%. And the risk of DVT was about 50% lower in patients with prophylaxis versus placebo, and that was accepted as being the natural history of the condition. Kim and Kim in 2000 looked at the natural history of DVT in their series, 200, uh, 200 total hip replacements, and they found significantly that thr small thrombi, when they occurred, did not progress to big thrombi or to embolism. Troutman, in uh, his uh, study in 2010, looked at the side effects, and this is, this is important for us to understand because this is an aspect that's not often publicised. There's bleeding, which would expect thrombocytopenia, osteoporosis, hepatitis, and alopecia, which I would regard as being a major problem. There are also allergic reactions, delayed type hypersensitivity, thr allergic thrombocytopenia, skin, skin necrosis, and rarely anaphylaxis. Now, the risk of a proximal DVT uh, is as shown in that slide. With, place with placebo, in Freeman's study in 2000, looking at all those patients, meta-analysis, risk of DVT was about 25%. That was brought down to about equal numbers, about 7% or so with warfarin and low molecular weight heparin. There was no significant difference between those two therapeutic modalities. The incidence of pulmonary embolus uh, with uh, placebo was about 1.5%. Warfarin brought that down to one-tenth. Uh, low molecular weight heparin and pneumatic compression were about equal in the uh, pulmonary embolism stakes. Freeman showed that there was no significant difference in mortality with any of the treatment options. The major bleeding risk with placebo was about 0.3% and with low dose heparin about 10 times that. The minor bleeding risk with placebo was about 2% about 7% with low-dose heparin and about 9% with low molecular weight heparin. Now, the risk of pulmonary embolism for all prophylactic agents combined was about 0.1%. And he showed that to demonstrate a 50% reduction in that incidence, you would require a study of 100,000 patients. Sharrick, in that landmark article in 2008, showed that the incidence of fatal pulmonary embolism has decreased significantly over the last 10 years, and now it's between 0 and 0.2 per cent. And that reflects changes in anesthesia, surgery, perioperative care, and our understanding of the underlying pathogenesis. These changes were not reflected in the previous Freeman study or in the studies referred to by the College of Chess Physicians. So there were three uh, groups of protocols that are currently available, the potent anti anticoagulants uh, from, the, from the Paranax, Rivaroxaban, etc., the antistasis, endothelial damage, uh, coagulability prevention drugs, aspirin is the commonest one, but also physical measures such as uh, pneumatic compressors, and the uh, old standby, the slow-acting anticoagulants, warfarin. Sharik examined the peer review literature and looked at uh, mortality with a potent anticoagulants of 0.4%, mechanical devices, half of that, and warfarin about the same as the expensive potent anticoagulants. So there was no difference in mortality between warfarin and the potent anticoagulants, and the mortality was less if you didn't use them. 
The non-fatal pulmonary embolism rate uh, he also looked at, and with warfarin it was approximately half a percent, and the potent anticoagulants about the same, and mechanical devices somewhat less. Now what is a DVT? Well, there's no real definition of what a DVT is, and it can be anything from two red cells linked by a strand of uh, fibrin to a 25 centimetre clot that blocks pulmonary outflow. Now, the function of the lung. The main non-respiratory function of the lung is to act as a filter, and it's no coincidence that the lung is placed between the heart and the brain. And as you stand from your seated position there, a shower of thrombi will be set loose and it will be filtered out by the lung. That's a normal occurrence. It happens all the time. A, the formation of a DVT is not an abnormality. The coalescence of the DVTs into a, a flow obstructing structure is the abnormality. Outdated postoperative mobilization programs were the guiding factors to the rules that were put to us. Most of these studies in the literature relate to prolonged bed rest, incapacitating analgesia, and long, slow rehabilitation, where an environment is created where these thrombies, thrombi can coalesce. Modifying the rehabilitation program can alter the incidence of these thromboembolic events. So what's the data? There's this paper from Bruce Corwell's uh, group in Sydney. He's a colleague on the other side of the harbour where he looked at early mobilisation after conventional knee replacements, early mobilisation within the face of a standard prophylactic program, and he showed that early mobilisation, which began within 24 hours, um, in 92.8% of the patients, their DVT rate fell from 27% to 1%. I'll say that again because that's significant. 27% to 1%. When adjusted for risk factors, there was a 30-fold reduction in the risk of DVT with early mobilisation. Another colleague, David Dickerson, looked at uh, early mobilisation after total knee replacement uh, and the incidence of DVT. And again, all patients were treated with a low molecular weight heparin, so they were, and uh, this was supervised by a physician. Some were mobilised within 24 hours and others were arrested on day one an ultrasound detected incidence of DVT was reduced from 32% to 14% in the early mobilisation group. Dennis presented this uh, yesterday, and I won't, uh, I won't labour it, but in, in the circled area, if you look at the total DVT rates for knee replacements in the worst incidence for total hip replacements, 20% versus 5%, and in the comparable group on the other side of the harbour with full physician-supervised anti-thromboembolic prophylaxis, 100% adherence, the incidence was 25% and, and almost 9%. So the message is that early mobilisation and mechanical factors are more effective than chemical treatments. Now the spin. Uh, this, I've, I found this to be totally outrageous. This paper in, uh, in BMJ in um, 2008 looked at... Uh, uh, the marketing of these uh, drugs with an aim to create a political environment removing the therapeutic decision from the clinician through marketing techniques, financial incentives and a public information campaign aimed at creating terror. Now, I won't labour that too much, but uh, read that. There's a, there's a campaign currently running in Australia under the banner of the Coalition of Health Professionals has generated headlines claiming that blood clots are more deadly than AIDS. An article suggesting that injections for patients at risk of developing clots may become mandatory. Fishman Hilliard's website said that the firm can help with conditioning the market for a company's drug and they can ensure that the product messages reach the right people at the right time and can facilitate relationships with third party organisations such as the Coalition Fighting Blood Clots. That's reassuring, isn't it? Uh, the Lancet study, which is often quoted, was sponsored, sponsored by Sanofi Aventis, which also provided editorial support for the journal article. Eight of the ten named authors disclosed direct or indirect financial ties to Sanofi Aventis, and one was an employee of the company. These are the authors of this paper. Okay. 
If they lie, will their noses grow like Pinocchio? But not, but not everybody was fooled, you see. Uh, Alastair Miller, a physician, said that the guidelines did not meet NHMRC endorsement standards. They exposed patients to a risk, uh, an unnecessary risk of bleeding complications. But despite this, Miller says, these guidelines have been taken up avidly by national and state bodies responsible for safety and quality in healthcare and mandated national application has been proposed. Have we forgotten this? So what are the options? Probably um, the, uh, the standard guidelines as published by the chest physicians really do not apply to us or at least not apply to the patients that we have to deal with this day and age. While these measures can prevent post-phlebitic syndrome, and that's a worthwhile aim, not at the risk of increasing death or compromising the index operation. Not all clots are the same. Small peripheral clots do not have the same significance as higher clots. Progression has not been documented in mobile patients without predisposing comorbidities. No study, no study has shown that prophylaxis decreases the incidence of fatal PE. Potent prophylactic agents, in fact, increase the overall mortality. Patients in published study groups may not have had the treatment protocol as your patients. The American Academy uh, has a protocol which is logical and easy and uh, it, does not, it, it is strictly for the prevention of pulmonary embolus. It does not address DVT. No study has shown aspirin to be better or worse than any other agent in preventing fatal PE. And in fact, aspirin is now a recommended option in the most recent American Academy guidelines. The guidelines uh, pr uh, propose four groups uh, as part of the stratification, and it's logical. Patients whose surgery put them at high risk of, of uh, PE or low risk, and patients whose physiology put them at high risk of bleeding or low risk of bleeding. So if you have a patient where there are uh, the standard risk, low risk of each of them. You have those four options, aspirin, low molecular weight heparin, pentasaccharide or warfarin with an INR of less than two, whichever one appeals to you as the treating surgeon. If they have an elevated risk of pulmonary embolus but a standard risk of bleeding, the options are there. Uh, aspirin has been removed. You can use low molecular weight heparin, warfarin or pentasaccharide. If they have a standard risk of bleeding um, of uh, pulmonary embolus but an elevated risk of bleeding, the options are aspirin, warfarin or none. You'd have the option of having thought about the risk, deciding that in the patient's interest you're not going to treat them with anything. And if they have everything going against you, a risky operation and a risk of pulmonary embolus, you also have those options. So the decision is put back on the clinician on the orthopaedic surgeon and away from the chest physician. There are some limitations to these guidelines, however. There is no definition of standard or elevated risk of pulmonary embolus, and there's no definition of standard or elevated risk of bleeding. So in summary, over the last 10 years, no prophylactic method has decreased the incidence of fatal PE. Potent thromboprophylaxis has been shown to increase the mortality. Addressing the mortality is more important than addressing the incidence of DVT and post syndrome, in my view. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Laurie.